Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Lynn, um, and this is what I do for a living. I jump about in tubes. Uh, no, it's not, that's not true. I'm, a, I'm an academic at Aberty, um, and I teach game design and animation. Um, and I'm also really interested in getting people to play. Um, unfortunately, I think in our society, play is often associated with children or with being childish. Um, and I guess I'm on a, an adventure to try and change that and to try to get people like you to play if you don't already. And if you do play, to harness that and do like really cool things with it. Um, and one of the ways that I've kind of been exploring that is looking at playful invitations and giving people different levels of participation. So trying to find uh, a level of playful participation that people are comfortable with because we have extroverts who are really happy to jump around and wave their arms and, and play really enthusiastically with their whole body, um, which is what we often see in, in children's playgrounds. Um, uh, we don't often see adults doing that in children's playgrounds, but you see children doing that sort of physical play. And then you have more sort of introverted play experiences, people that are quite happy playing solitaire or, or games by themselves, for example. Um, so I've been playing with different kinds of invitations and I've been trying to put them in places that may or may not be obvious in terms of play. So I actually I make a lot of uh, digital games, and digital games that try to blur the boundary between um, the, the real space, the play space, the players that are playing together um, and the screen. Um, and then I also go a little bit old school and use an awful lot of chalk. So I pretty much always have chalk on me. Um, and one of the kinds of levels of participation that I've been experimenting with is ambient invitations. So things that you might um, happen upon on the street that may suggest to you that you could play. You don't have to, but everybody knows that the floor is lava. So um, sometimes in town, I will take a bit of chalk and I'll make parts of the floor is lava. And I'll then lurk in the street and see if anybody um, takes me up on that invitation. You don't have to. I mean, some people just walk by and they have a little smile and that's a nice moment. It takes them back to their childhood. Other people um, will say to me, I saw your lava today. I played, it was good fun. Um, then I have um, playful encounters, I, I guess I'm, I'm calling them, which aren't actually anything that you have to do, but it might be an observation of something that I thought was a bit funny, like trying to look at the world in a different way. So I really like these are just at um, Dundee High and you see them outside all schools and I just sort of thought it kind of looks like the pavement's got a crown and I know it's really kind of quite childish. Um, but that's what I'm all about, like let's look at the world in slightly different ways. Let's look up, let's look around, let's not just look at our phones um, and look at the world differently. So in these sorts of things, it's, it's that sort of invitation. It's, well, let's just turn the frame to the side a little bit or, or look at something in a different way. Um, and then I also make like direct calls to action. So I make things that require people to participate. So this might be for, for people that are more extroverted or more comfortable with play. And um, this is a game that I'll talk about a little bit more that I made with Mona actually, who was up here just a minute ago and a couple of our um, industry co colleagues called Tales of Monstrous Intent. We love a pun. Um, and it's played inside a tent. It's a digital computer game, but it's not actually about what's happening on the screen. It's about the interaction between the three players that sit inside the tent. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that just now. Um, so these are the kind of things that I'm doing and I thought I would just talk to you about the different ways that I'm trying to enhance participation. So the different ways that I'm trying to get people like you um, to play. Um, sorry about that resolution in that middle one there. Um, so the ways that I'm using chalk in this whole movement that we um, that I'm collaborating with online with a bunch of playful colleagues called One Play Thing. The way that we're using different kinds of digital games. This is a digital game called Ola de la Vida, which is often heard, uh, known as the poncho game. Um, it's a three player game that involves you dressing up as a poncho and basically having a bit of a tug of war. And the, uh, the tent game, which is a three player game where you sit in a tent and you have to help, you have to watch each other's back to help survive the night. I'll talk a little bit more about these examples as I talk about the different ways that I'm trying to get people to participate. Um, so one way is spectacle. We make things that are, they try to be kind of quite spectacular. They draw attention to themselves. So the things in the street, they draw attention to themselves. You walk past them, you see them, you might smile or you might think that's a little bit silly, um, but you will notice them. And similarly with things like Ola de la Vida, which is the, the poncho game, this is a massive game. So when you um, enter a sort of arcade space, it stands out, it uses three projectors. So it actually is, um, the play space is about as wide as the shroom. Um, and the people that play it have to wear this three-player poncho, they have to hold magical golden maracas, and they have to dance with each other to help these little digital creatures to move across the screen. Did I say, actually, to play this game, you have to hold hands the whole time as well? So uh, one of my sub-objectives is to make people, people feel a little bit awkward, um, and also to give them context um, to get them to do pretty much anything I want them to do. Because uh, I found that if you give people a reason for a behavior, they will do it. Um, 
That's uh, my mastermind secret, I think. So we use spectacle a lot, um, large scale um, uh, kind of uh, pieces to try and draw people's attention as a drawing in. This is an opportunity that I cannot miss. I have to participate. Um, similarly with that, this idea of ephemerality. So the games that we make, um, Ola de la Vida is massive. You can't play that in your front room. The game that's in a tent, I don't think anybody's going to build a tent in their front room to play a computer game. Um, if you are, give me a shout. I'll bring the tent. We can, we can, we can play it in your house. Um, I also do some things with the... I, I love chalk because the chalk doesn't last. So it's, um, it's a really uh, benign form of graffiti. You can draw with chalk and you pretty much can't get in an awful lot of trouble. Well, there's a lot of people that when I've been chalking will abandon me because they don't want to get in trouble. But it washes away, you know? Um, so uh, people will be drawn into participating because they know something's not going to be there for very long. So this is maybe their only opportunity to participate. Novelty has a similar sort of call. So the maracas and the poncho, a lot of people like to take selfies in this poncho. Not the point in the game at all, but they love the, the novelty of it all. Um, we provide permission, so um, sometimes we won't let. This is, a, this is a character that we've come up with called, in one play thing called Norman. And Norman is the person that stops us from playing. Norman is the adult that says, no, play is not allowed. Um, so what I try to do in a lot of the things that I make is provide permission for people. This is not providing permission. Um, but giving them, just saying, it's OK, you can do this. You can play in, in different ways. So the poncho um, in Ola de la Vida is a really nice way of providing permission because it, um, it, it helps you become one with your team members. So it's one poncho, three heads. So as soon as you place it on, you feel like a team. You also feel like you're a little bit in, a, in costume. You're a character. So it's not you that's playing. It's not you that's pulling at each other. It's not you that everyone's looking at. It's someone else. And that helps to ease anxiety. We've, I've, I've done proper academic focus groups where it does help to ease people's anxiety to, about playing and helps to provide permission. Other things that we do is we, we lower barrier, barriers. So all the games that I make um, or I collaborate on do not use um, Xbox or, three, uh, or PlayStation controllers, which have 40 odd different combinations of buttons which stop people from playing. They, they use really abstracted forms of interaction that nobody knows how to use. So you have to work it out together, which lowers the barrier to entry. For the chalk, um, I also make these little packs and I leave them in places. Um, and the really nice thing about chalk is pretty much everybody can afford chalk or hopefully they can find one of my packs so they've got chalk so they can play. You know, there's, there's nothing stopping you other than yourself. Um, so we, we have these little um, information sheets that go with it that are trying to provide permission saying, like, here's some things that you could do with this chalk. Um, and what people tend to do is they hark back to things that they did when they were kids. They'll do hopscotch or they'll do um, knots and crosses. Um, because that's what we know. And that's a really nice way. It's a, an entry way into play by starting with things that you know. Um, so similarly, this sort of accessibility, um, being able to, uh, to not uh, feel like you have to design play, but to, to, to draw from kind of nostalgia. In our digital games, um, we tried using mimetic interfaces to help accessibility. So there's this, you know, I was saying about these really complex controllers that you get. Um, a mimetic interface is just that you see the action in the real world, and that action is uh, repeated on screen. Um, so then you can learn how to play the game by watching, which makes it easier to enter into playing a game. Because I think a lot of people don't want to participate because they're like, oh, I won't be any good at it. I don't know how it works. So we try and make things that you can work out how they work by watching them um, so that that, again, lowers the, the chance, uh, lowers the barrier to entry in terms of participating. Um, and a lot of the things. Actually, games and museums and, and galleries use this a lot. Is this a concept of a social object? If you place something in a bunch of people, um, it will, uh, if they have an opportunity to interact with that thing, this is inside the tent, by the way, um, it distracts them from the, uh, the fact that they're interacting with other people because they're interacting with the thing, which then allows them to interact with other people. So in this game, a monster appears behind you, and you can't see the monster, so your other two uh, chums, they have to tell you whether to duck left, duck right, um, stay still, um, or duck forward. Um, and if they don't tell you, you're not going to survive the night, so you have to cooperate, and it, it, the, the game makes it a very social experience. So even if you're playing it with other people you don't know, you're not so worried about that because you're focusing on the objective of the game. Um, we also uh, tap into things like emotional contagion, and that's just the idea that positive emotions um, snowball. So if you're in a big space and people are having fun, you start to sort of feel like it's a good experience, and that's going to lower your barrier, barrier to entry. 
Um, and we also make a lot of things that require you to cooperate with other people. So my big question really is community is working together, uh, lowering the barrier to, barrier to participation, or actually is community working against it? Is community the Normans? Are they the reason that you wouldn't chalk on the street? Are they the reasons that you wouldn't participate in hopscotch if I leave a hopscotch mat for you? Um, is the community the reason that you might not play a game like Ola de la Vida because you're worried about how people are looking at you? Or is the community having fun and egging you on and um, friendly banter, is that the reason that you want to play? Um, I think community is a really positive thing around play, um, but I just wanted to leave you with that question. Thank you very much.